Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Yeager. Welcome to Symposium X. Today I have a very exciting speaker next to me, Stefan Thomas. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we are so excited about your talk about web monetization. And um, would you like to share with the audience uh, what is your company Koi and what is web monetization to you means? Absolutely. So Coil is a company we founded last year. Um, we are trying to create a better business model for the web. Um, and as part of that, we're creating a new web standard or promoting a new web standard called web monetization. Um, and what web monetization allows you to do is it allows browsers to pay websites as you're going around the web. Um, and so you don't need other forms of monetization uh, like ads or subscriptions, or at least it provides an alternative. So we know that you produce a very popular what is Bitcoin video. So yeah. now I want to ask you, when was that produced and what is going to be the next sequel? <laughs> so um, the video was made in late 2010 uh, and then the beginning of 2011. It came out in February. Um, and we essentially wanted to explain what cryptocurrency was. Um, and I think looking back, I mean, this is now almost 10 years ago. Um, we ourselves didn't really know what <laughs> cryptocurrency was and, and I learned a lot in the in the eight years after that. And so I think if I was making a sequel today, I would focus less on the currency um, and more on payments and kind of like how different payment networks connect together. Um, so I think that um, my focus has definitely shifted since then. Okay, that's very really exciting. I heard that the French are putting Bitcoin curriculum in the high school. And so I think that they may want to have this what is Bitcoin video in their curriculum. So that's wonderful. So why, what do you see about the adoption of Bitcoin in the financial services industry? I mean, there's a, a lot of exciting things happening. Um, Libra and uh, all the cryptocurrency and mm -hmm. maybe going into a cryptocurrency war. I don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen. What do you think? Yeah, so I mean, uh, as as uh, formerly I was CTO at Ripple and in that position, like that was pretty much my job was to think about how does cryptocurrency and, and uh, distributed ledger technology get into the financial system. Um, you know, because Bitcoin, I think when we first started on it, it was more intended as an alternative to banks and we didn't really think about like how do we integrate. Um, whereas with, with XRP, and, and uh, Ripple as a company, um, we were much more interested in, in how does it actually um, you know, connect to the existing financial system. Um, and so some of the things that, that we changed in order to make that possible is, um, if you think of Bitcoin, one of the first things you think of is mining. Um, and mining has a number of issues with it. Um, the most uh, immediate is sort of the ecological impact of mining. Um, Bitcoin, there's just a new paper published, um, I just saw today, I think it's from the University of Denmark. Um, uh, but basically, it, uh, they estimated that it's 17.29 megatons of CO2 that Bitcoin uh, releases every year. Um, and so during our research, we essentially found that essentially mining is not required for consensus. There's been a lot of research into consensus even prior to Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, mining is not required for consensus. What it's required for is to select essentially who gets to participate in consensus. Um, to have a way to kind of have in automatic or implicit selection of nodes. Um, and with XRP, we decided to get rid of that um, and basically make it um, the user that decides which nodes they want to listen to. Um, and so it's essentially the financial institutions that are participating in the network that decide who the validators are and who they want to listen to. Um, and so the requirement for mining goes away. And not just that, it actually makes it so that um, you, you can choose better nodes. Um, so things like um, being more di geographically distributed or being more trustworthy or having better physical security in their data centers. And so as a result, XRP Ledger now has a much more distributed and much more um, globally diverse um, and much more high security and high trust set of validators than Bitcoin has. Um, and so that's just one example, and I could go on for hours, obviously. Yeah. But um, you know, I think those are some of the changes that we need to see before these technologies can get into the mainstream. It's very really exciting. Um, I don't want to steal your thunder, because later you're going to talk about uh, your big talk, right, about web monetization. Uh, but explain in simple language, what, what is Interledger? Uh, what is it all about? Mm. Yeah, so 
Yeah, I kind of spent like almost a decade working on blockchains and, and cryptocurrency. Um, and one of the conclusions I took away with was that there isn't ever going to be one cryptocurrency that wins or like one ledger that everyone in the world is going to use um, because there are so many different countries, so many different banks and financial institutions and so many different use cases for banking and finance and payments um, that you just can't agree on one technology that serves every use case the best. Um, and so once you make that realization, it starts to be less about how to design the best possible ledger and more how do ledgers actually connect to each other. So if I have my bank ledger in the US and you have a mobile money account in Africa, how do I actually send you money? Um, and so that's why we started this project called Interledger and it actually started as a community group uh, at W3C um, and we started to, to think about this problem. And what we realized over time was that the internet actually gives you a blueprint for interoperability for anything, which is, you know, you have these different networks, you can't all connect them directly because then the number of required connections uh, goes up quadratically. And so you need these intermediary hops. So you need some way to route across the network. And so you just step by step, you get closer and closer to what the internet does for data. Um, and so over the next uh, couple of years, we basically did that research, we did that work, and we published um, some specs for how you would do that. And that's what the Intelligent Project has become. And so now my focus has shifted to how do we actually get Intelligent out into the real world and get people using it. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, so very quickly, um, Stefan, you're not a robot, are you? <laughs> okay, right? Not that I know of. All right, okay. You know, a yeah. robot might be programmed to say that. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to know the Stefan, the person, what motivates you, what, what drives you to, to come to this point where you are a, an innovator and mm. you're doing something very uh, disruptive? Mm. Um, what drives you? Yeah, what motivates you? Yeah, I mean, it, that's a really good question because I think, like, um, I often ask myself that question, it's like, why do, you, why do you do all this? And I think for me, it's like um, having experienced the friction in payments as a freelance web developer, um, both on the sending side where I'm paying other uh, developers or other designers that I'm working with, or on the receiving side when I'm being paid, um, and just so many people taking money off the top. and, and there's this very stark contrast between how efficient and how fast and how frictionless communication has become. So everyone gets to access the internet and they get to access information. But then you have, on the other hand, you have um, payments and people don't have access to payments. Or if they do, there's all these fees and all these delays. In the US, you can still do wire transfers where it takes days to get to the destination. And so it's like, um, it's just a huge amount of friction in the system. And so. Um, from my perspective, perspective, that's pr that's limiting a lot of um, you know opportunity for for people. So that's the thing I'm excited about to change. So in the audience, I have some of my students here. Uh, what it takes to join your company? Can you make some advice to them? To join or to yeah, start? Or to start and join. <laughs> I always favor starting companies over joining <laughs> companies, but I guess you know not everybody can do that. Otherwise, we'll all be working for ourselves. Um, I would say that um, like what I look for is actually less, you know, some some you know special fancy degree, and more like what have you done outside of the things that that your parents force you to do, or that other people force you to do, um, and kind of what what have you done out of your own initiative, um, because that's going to be what motivates you going forward, right? Like if it's only external motivations that drive you, then you're not going to be a great person to work with, because I'm going to constantly have to be after you and chasing you down for deadlines and things like that, and you're not going to enjoy that either. So I think for me the biggest thing is like figuring out what motivates somebody and when I look at a resume that that's what I'm looking for is like are they actually somebody that you know do you care about making giving more people access to payment networks or do you care about um, equality or whatever it is that drives you so those are the things that I look for thank you Stefan um, so um, come to Symposi Symposium X and you will hear about Stefan Thomas talk thank you thank you <laughs> thank, thank you Rachel you. <laughs>